Is it okay? All right. Okay, well, uh, thanks very much, uh, Jacopo, for, uh, for having me. Um, so I, uh, I work in Basel here. Uh, this building is our, oh God, this is difficult. Uh, this is the new biocentrum that we just moved in one year ago or so, uh, and this is the group. All right, so the topic of uh, today's talk is um, E. coli's uh, amazing versatility as most of you know, a simple organism like uh, E. coli can adapt its gene expression to really an enormous range and combination of environments, so changes in uh, nutrients, in different stresses, temperatures, pH, osmotic pressure, and so on and so on and so on. And these can all be in large numbers of co combinations, and somehow it finds a way to adapt its gene expression to, to grow in all these environments. And um, the traditional explanation of, of how E. coli does that is, uh, well, E. coli has uh, all these sensors and regulators that form this complex regulatory networks, like here's a picture I stole from some review, and basically, these sensors measure what kind of environment E. coli is in. And these sensors are then coupled to regulators that set the gene expression levels. And there is this complex regulatory network that is there to basically control the gene expression of all the genes. And it is indeed true. So this is some very ancient work, uh, which is showing that as you go to larger bacteria, the numbers of sensors and regulators is growing disproportionately. So the numbers of sensors and regulators that a, gene, a bacterial genome of size G has grows as G squared. So this is saying, yes, yeah, see where if you have a bigger bacterium with more genes, it can live in more environments. And so it needs all these regulators and all these sensors to be able to set the expression levels. And so the idea is, the picture is that through evolution, Bacteria have learned what the correct combination of expression levels is in each environment. And that basically this regulatory network has then been designed by evolution to make sure the cell will set the correct expression levels in each of the environments. OK, so uh, the first thing I want to convince you of is that that picture cannot be correct. All right, so it cannot really work like this. That uh, E. coli has simply learned through evolution to sense where am I? Aha, I'm in, a, I'm in the gut of a human or I'm in the sewer. And that means I have to set my expression levels like this because evolution has taught me these are the right expression levels for this environment. So what are uh, the observations that challenge this picture? I, so the first thing is that um, if you, all right. So many molecules in the cell are at low copy numbers. So in particular, the DNA is typically at one or two copy numbers in a cell. And so when a gene expression event happens, a transcription event, that's a single molecule event, OK? That happens at a single molecule in the cell. And because there is just thermodynamic noise, the cell cannot say, make one transcript exactly every minute. The only thing that the cells can control is the rate at which various reactions happen. And so even if the rates of reaction are constant, so if you have a constant rate of transcription, translation, and decay, then the CV squared, so the variation in the, in the number of proteins you're going to get if this thing were to work, uh, is basically going like 1 over the total number of proteins. All right. And so um, if we now look at what is the distribution of the total protein count, so this is being measured uh, about a little over a decade ago by um, Taniguchi et al. You see that actually most genes in E. coli typically have less than 10 or less proteins per cell. Okay, so most genes, this number, n, the number of proteins per cell, is low, which means there must be large variability 
from cell to cell homogeneity, even if, even if all the rates were constant. Of course, in reality, transcription, translation, and dilution will fluctuate in time from cell to cell. And these rates will depend on binding and unbinding of transcription factors and RNA binding products and so on. And so these rates will also be all stochastic. So in general, the stochasticity will be even bigger. This is like a lower bound. Now, these low copy numbers, they also apply to sensors. So uh, many of the sensors are these two component sensors. And here is from some um, proteomic study from Alex Schmidt the distribution across different environments of the numbers of, of copies that these sensors have per cell. And again, what I sort of just want to focus your attention to is that many of them, in a lot of environments, have less than 10 copies per cell. Okay, so these, these sensors are also present in low copy numbers. And there is this old seminal work of Burke and Purcell that basically shows that the accuracy of sensing is also going like one over n. This is all coming from sampling noise, essentially, right? This, this one over uh, n accuracy. And so if at 10 sensors, the cell will basically have one bit of information about what the thing is sensing, all right? So it can tell this thing is not there, or there's a lot of it, but it cannot tell, you know, there's a tiny bit or a bit more or a bit more. Yes. Um, just as a, as a question to the sensing, I, and I'm not a biologist, so maybe this is very yeah, my, wrong. I very good. On television. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh. My understanding is that cells don't actually feel the existence of something, but rather the flux. So like chemo-attracted, you don't feel the environment, but you feel the change. They're only attracted because there's no, a gradient. That, that's a downstream pop property of this network. But what's happening molecularly Right? And that's what is happening in this Burke Purcell paper is about, is that there is a, a, rece a receptor on the cell, and there is some molecule, and it binds and unbinds stochastically from this receptor. And the only, and the only thing that the cell senses is this basically this time course of bound, unbound, bound, unbound, 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 which is controlled by, right? So these molecules, they do Brownian motion. And, and that's where these bounds are coming from. But still sort of over time, right? They sort of integrate over a certain amount of time. It's not that at every time point you feel this, but. OK, so or is that, that, is, that is like 40 years of work yeah. on can you do better than this, OK? And essentially, you cannot really do better than this. Yes, of course, you can, you can, you can do time averages. You can couple it to things that lies ATP, do sort of error correcting, uh, uh, kinetic proofreading like things, and so on. So uh, we can talk about it for a long time, but the, the, the the bottom line that I want to make is that there is no way that the cell can tell its environment with high accuracy, given the low copy number. All right. So the summary of the, these points is that regulators and sensors are themselves also subject to expression noise. So this will make it even more variable. And so this says that the sensing and regulation that individual cells do must have low accuracy. And so the picture that I get from this is that cells are effectively stumbling around in the dark with relatively little information about where they are. All right, so that's, that's point number one. The second point is something that I learned from uh, Sidney Brenner about a little over 20 years ago, and that really influenced my thinking about how these regulatory networks work, and that is that you can, that E. coli can adapt this gene expression to environments that are completely alien to it and they can not have evolved to recognize, all right? So what you can do is you can take E. coli and put it in fully deuterated water, right? So all the, all the hydrogens in water are, are deuterium. And NMR people like to do that because they like to make versions of proteins with deuterium in them and so on. And uh, the thing is, Eukaryotic cells all die when you try to put them in there, but a cell like E. coli, it will simply adapt. And this thing is a severe perturbation to the cell's chemical network, right? So all the reactions that involve water in one way or another, they now happen at a completely different rate, maybe tenfold up, tenfold down, maybe even up to two orders of magnitude change. And somehow E. coli takes a while, takes a couple hours, 
But then you find that E. coli has adapted its gene expression state. Hundreds of genes have changed their expression level, sometimes by very large amounts. These are often enzymes that are involved in these reactions that involve water. And it found in a new solution in which it's now growing exponentially at only sort of half the rate that it would grow in normal water at the same condition. And the point is that evolution cannot have prepared E. coli for any of this. All right, so the way it's found the solution to the problem must be some generic mechanism. It cannot be something that's learned in evolution. Yes? Yeah, I was thinking about this example because it was mentioned in the talks uh, before by Hugo, I think. But uh, yeah, what if the cells could then nevertheless, okay, it cannot sense deuterium directly, but it could sense something which correlates with the deuterium. So maybe there are other parameters which change similarly to how other variables to which a coli is accustomed to would change. And basically the cells just sense that and adapt to the change because if, if deuterium, if the water is a bit heavier, then probably some kind of rates will change, something like that. So the cell could okay, still so, sense a, yeah. So I appreciate very much that you understand the puzzle. Okay, and, and so I've been thinking about this puzzle for 20 years, and so I will try to give you what I think is ingredients to the answer to this puzzle. Okay, okay. so Look. then at the end of the talk, you can tell me whether that fits with what you're currently imagining or not. Okay, okay. looking forward to it, okay. thanks. Please. All right, so what might this generic adaptation mechanism be? So basically what I wanna do is I wanna go through some things results from the sort of the last uh, 10 years in my lab that I think sort of are bringing together in my head at least a picture of how this might be working. All right, so the first ingredient for this generic adaptation mechanism is that growth rate through the effects of dilution sets the sensitivity of regulatory switches. I wanna actually spend probably most time on this, on this um, part. Um, Okay, so can I stop this? No, of course I cannot. Stop, oh, okay. So, um, we've been looking at a system which I, you know, I'd like to call the hydrogen atom of uh, gene regulation, which is the, the lack regulatory circuit, which is shown here, so there is this, um, um, operon that has an enzyme for eating lactose, it has a transporter of lactose, and, and one thing that it's still not entirely clear what it's doing. And basically, the, and then this, um, this promoter is normally repressed by this repressor LAC I. When there is lactose in the environment, comes in through the transporter, allolactose, which is made by this LAC Z, binds to LAC I, inhibits it, that induces the operon, makes more of this transporter, means more lactose gets transported in. So there is this positive feedback loop. So depending on how much lactose in the environment, this loop can go critical and induce expression, and then the cells will start eating uh, uh, lactose. And actually, it's this system that led to the discovery of gene regulation, transcription factors, mRNAs, and so on. Um, and so this, uh, this is sort of really sort of the canonical example of a gene regulatory circuit. And now we've put this in this uh, mother machine. So you've heard about these microfluidic devices where cells are growing in a single file. And now we're gonna switch them every four hours between glucose and lactose. And you will see, now they switch to lactose. Everybody stopped growing. Some guys are still stopped, but some other guys are already inducing lactose and they're growing again. So the observations that we have when we do this is that when you switch to lactose the first time, everybody stops growing immediately. Then there is a stochastic waiting period. Then cells start waking up, and as soon as we can see expression of, of the lac operon, they, they grow. And upon later switches, there are no more growth rates. So the green is the lactose. Yes, yeah, so this is in this, uh, so it's even shown in this picture. So the GFP protein was added to lactose. So these are actually fusions of lac and GFP that you're looking at, okay? All right. So now, the observation 
that we made is that the distribution of lag times is bimodal. So 30% of cells are fast and they go between 20 and 45 minutes. And then there is a second hump where two thirds of the cell go between, you know, let's say uh, 50 minutes, an hour, two, two, three, four hours. Okay? And, okay, so it's a long story. We looked at okay, what determines whether a cell is, is uh, slow or fast. But basically, the answer is it's determined by pre existing lock expression. Okay? And the, one of the ways that we know this is that we can manipulate this distribution by giving tiny amounts of repressor of the lock repressor, this, this TMG molecule or IPTG that you can add to the cells. It basically turns off some of the repressors, which even though the lock operon won't be induced, it will increase a little bit of the leaky expression that happens when they're growing in glucose. And you will see, so if you add, um, if you add a little bit of inhibition of the repressor, you will see you will now you push the distribution to that now 50% of the cells is, is fast. And if you give a bit more, 65% of the cells is fast. Whereas if you give lock repressor protein from a plasmid, so you make more repressor, now you can move that essentially everybody is slow. Okay, so how much is in the first mode and how much is in the second mode, you can change by changing the expression level of this repressor. And this repressor is known to only target the lacoporon in E. coli. It doesn't target anything else. All right, so giving these tiny amounts of uh, more of this repressor or less is not going to affect anything else than the pre-existing expression of this lacoporon. And that's why whether you're in the left peak or in the right peak, is determined on how much pre-existing lock you had at low level when the switch came. Okay, so the question is now, how much lock do you need to have to make this feedback loop go critical? Okay, what is the critical amount? And so we did experiments where we induced the cells in lactose, and then we grew them in glucose for a variable amount of time, and then we switched to lactose again. And so when they're in glucose, they're no longer expressing the lock operon. So what is happening is that the amount of GFP per cell and the amount of lac C is sort of diluting with time. And because we're in this mother machine, we can actually track as it's diluting in time. So even when it falls below the detection limit, we can still, from the growth of the cells and the divisions, estimate how many lac C and lac Y molecules were left in this cell when we came back with the lactose. All right? And so then what you can plot is as a function of how many GFP molecules have you inherited from, the, from your ancestor that was growing in lactose, what is the fraction of short legs? And you see to go back to the original fraction of short legs, around 30%, you need to basically go down to one molecule. All right? So, the number of pre-existing lock molecules that you need for this feedback loop to go critical is very small, all right, on the order of one molecule. So when these cells are sitting there, growth arrested, they're extremely sensitive. If they have no lock expression, they cannot detect lactose because it cannot even get into the cell. But as soon as you have one, two, three molecules of lock Y and lock Z, that's enough for this feedback loop to go critical. Now, the first time we saw this, with work, we were surprised because we knew a paper from 2008 where very similar experiments were done, where the conclusion was that the critical amount of lock expression for the feedback loop to go critical is, uh, is around a few hundred molecules. So not a handful or one, but hundreds. Okay, so this is a hundredfold difference. And so the question is, okay, where is this coming from? Well, the only difference between our experiments and these experiments is that in those experiments, they didn't really use glucose and lactose, but they grow the cells in glycerol, and then they add different amounts of artificial inducer that the cells don't eat. And so in that case, the cells are always growing, okay? And they're giving this inducer while the cells are growing, whereas in our case, the, the cells went into growth arrest. So what it suggests is that when cells are in growth arrest, they are much more sensitive to the signal than when they're growing. So then the question is, can we understand that? It turns out, well, it's very trivial to understand that. 
So you take the sort of simplest models of this uh, lock operon. This is just a couple of the couple differential equations. So this is due to a paper from uh, Ospudak et al. of 2004. We just adapted it to take into account that the internal concentrations of the inducer and of the transporter, they're, they're given by a balance of this is import and dilution, and this is production and dilution. And so basically, the growth rate of the cell sets the rate at which these molecules are diluting because these new molecules are very stable on the, on the lifetime that cells double in size. And so basically, what you find is that the critical point of this feedback loop is controlled by this dimensionless parameter, which depends on, so B here in the denominator is essentially the concentration of the molecule of lactose outside, AL, a of lambda, sorry, is the maximum rate of production of protein from the lacoperon at growth rate lambda. And then here is basically lambda squared because these decay rates are small. So you see that this essentially depends quadratically on growth rate. And so we decide, so this is basically the summary of what this very simple model says. The very simple model says, okay, so you have this positive feedback circuit. And as a function of the doubling time of the cell and the level of the inducer outside, you basically get this phase diagram with an uninduced state, an induced state, and a bistable state. And you see that when you're growing slow, when you're growing, sorry, when you're growing fast, you need a lot more inducer to induce than when you're growing slow. Okay? So we tested this. And this is a very simple experiment to test, right? So this could have been done by Monod in the 60s when they discovered the lacoperon regulation. You simply grow E. coli in different environments where they grow at different rates. You add artificial inducer and ask, how much do I have to add before the feedback loop goes critical, OK? So this is what you see. So each line here is E. coli in a, is diff, it growing in different nutrients that make it grow at different rates. And then on the x-axis is this uh, artificial inducer. On the y-axis is the population expression of lactose. And so you get these induction curves. You can work out where is the critical concentration. And then you can plot the critical concentration as a function of, um, of doubling time. And you see that it actually decreases a little bit faster even than quadratically. Okay, So this is going from sort of a half an hour to four hour doubling time. And this is almost a hundredfold change in how much of this inducer you need to induce the feedback loop. All right. What time is it? How long have I talked? 20 minutes. OK. Um, OK, so there is something very cool you can do with this. But I, I think I'm going to first do the rest of the talk, and then I'm going to come back to it. So I'm going to skip this. All right. So basically, the, the, the insight is that growth rate through dilution sets the sensitivity of these kind of positive feedback regulatory switches. And, and so this is a very general mechanism. So we expect this to occur for basically almost any of these regulatory switches with positive feedback. So for example, the sort of simplest system you can imagine is a switch that is really doesn't have any input signal. And it just switches as a function of growth rate. So if you simply have an operon that contains a transcription factor that positively regulates its own expression, then you look at the phase diagram, you see that depending on what sort of the basal level of the operon, the basal expression level, and doubling time, it will go from off uh, to induce, to bistable to induce. So you could, for example, imagine that a phage that uh, might want to use such a system that it integrates itself in the genome and it stays in the genome as long as its host is growing fast enough. And when the host is growing slow, then this system goes critical and the phase says, I go lytic. I get the hell out of here. Okay? Um, but many, many regulatory switches in these bacteria have this kind of architecture, that there is a positive feedback loop that is coupled to a signal, either through the decay rate of the regulator that is coupled to the signal, or many of these two component systems that bacteria use, they are uh, basically they consist of a regulator and a, and a membrane-bound kinase that positively feedback on each, 
on themselves and the kinase is coupled to an external signal. And so all these systems, they will have the feature that their induction does not only depend on the signal strength, but also on the doubling time of the cell, and that typically the, grow, the slower the cells grow, the more sensitive the system becomes to the external system. <coughs> okay, so actually in the, in the supplement of the thing, I go through a whole number of these sort of architectures that you could set up and say, how is it gonna scale with growth rate depending on how you set it up exactly and so on. And I only scratch the surface of a couple of ways you can do this. You can build many, many, many circuits that can scale anywhere from not scaling with growth rate to like third order with growth rate or something like this, right? It depends on how you set up the details. Oh, back. Okay, so the summary of this is um, cells through dilution affecting the sensitivity of these regulatory circuits basically automatically are provided with this strategy that when life is good, and they're growing fast, they're essentially muting the signals from their environment and not paying any attention to fluctuations of signals from their environment. And when they start growing very slow, when life is bad, they become much more sensitive to signals coming from their environment and are much more likely to switch their state. Okay? So that's, that's number one. Okay, second ingredient. Gene expression fluctuations are driven by propagation of noise from regulators to their targets. So we're now gonna look at gene expression noise. So one of the ways you can look at gene expression noise is to use um, transcriptional reporters, fluorescent reporters, and, and, look, and use flow cytometry. Put cells through a fox, measure the amount of GFP uh, in each cell, and look at distribution. So uh, luckily, lab of Uri Alon, so there's this paper from Saslaver, they made a library where essentially they, they took every promoter in E. coli, and put it on in front of GFP on a plasmid. So you can put these plasmids in your cells, and then you can put your cells through a fox machine, and you basically get a distribution <coughs> of expression levels in the cells for the same gene. So these are isogenic cells growing in the same environment. And so, so we've done this extensively, and basically for almost all genes, the distribution of expression levels is log normal. Okay, so this is, this is expression levels on a log scale, and you get basically roughly Gaussian distributions on this uh, log scale, so you can characterize the distribution by its mean and variance. All right, so now you can make plots. So here's a plot on the, on the left, where every dot is an E. coli promoter, and on the x-axis, this damn thing doesn't work again, on the x-axis is the mean of log expression, on the y-axis the variance of log expression, Okay, so you see there's this systematic dependence between mean and variance. This is actually very easy to understand. It comes from, again, the Poisson noise of the production and also the, actually the Poisson noise of the fax machine because it uses a photomultiplier to, to measure this thing, so there is also a Poisson noise in that. But basically, there is one term here which dominates at large expression, which is the sort of the true variation in log expression which is dampened by a factor that depends on the, on the outer fluorescence of the cells. And then there is this Poissonian term that goes like one over mean, and, and that is coming from both the measurement Poisson fluctuations and the internal intrinsic noise fluctuations. But so what you can do is you can correct for that term, and then you basically get what is the excess noise above this, this lower bound on noise that, that each gene has. All right. So what we did in an early study is we compared this excess noise of the native E. coli promoters with a library of synthetic promoters that we got by taking completely random 100 base pair inserts, putting them on in front of GFP on the same plasmid, so exactly the same construct, and then selecting out the subset that are expressing. Okay, so we selected guys by gating that are either expressing at sort of the mean of all E. coli promoters or at a, at a 95 percentile, sort of as high as ribosomal promoters. And so those are shown in red. So there is basically a cluster here on the left. These are these mean expressors, and the cluster here on the right is the high expressors. And then on the y-axis is the excess noise. And basically what we notice is that essentially all these synthetic promoters have low excess noise. All right, so if you take a random sequence and you, and you select random sequences that express, 
they will all be low noise. Okay? Now, we check these promoters. As far as I can tell, these promoters only have binding sites for the sigma factor for the polymerase. So these are essentially constitutively expressed promoters. They have no regulation. So promoters without regulation seem to be low noise. So we managed to sort of con um, confirm this by, now this is, we've measured, so Aransa, she measured the whole library in uh, eight different growth conditions and measured the uh, mean of variance of all E. coli promoters. And basically you see that in every environment uh, there is a good correlation between the number of regulatory inputs that a gene has and noise. So basically what happens here is we, we sorted all the promoters from all of them to ones with higher and higher noise, and then we looked at the distribution of number of regulatory inputs. And so this is showing the mean plus standard deviation of the number of regulatory inputs of promoters that have a certain amount of noise. And you see that so the most noisy promoters are the ones with many regulatory inputs. And this is true in every growth condition. Moreover, if you look at one promoter at a time and ask how does its mean and variance change across growth conditions, you find out that basically every promoter has its own characteristic way of changing its mean and noise across conditions. So it's not the case that some promoters are always low noise and some promoters are always high noise. It's that in each condition, different promoters are more or less noisy. All right, so the noise levels of promoter are highly condition dependent. And so these observations can be explained by saying that a lot of this expression noise, this excess noise on top of this lower bound, is coming from propagation of noise from regulators to their targets. Right, so the, the basic idea is that if you have this pink gene here that is regulated by the blue transcription factor and the loop blue transcription factor doesn't fluctuate much from cell to cell, then the, uh, then the pink gene will also not uh, fluctuate much from cell to cell, whereas in this condition, some other transcription factor that is regulating the yellow gene may, may be much more variable in its activity from cell to cell. Then the yellow promoter will also be more variable in its expression from, promoter, uh, from uh, cell to cell, so that this noise in these regulators propagates to the targets, right? And so which genes are noisy in a given condition is basically determined by which regulators are noisy in a given condition, and this varies from condition to condition. But the more regulatory inputs a gene has, the more likely it is that at least one of these transcription factors is noisy in this condition. So in general, it will be that the most noisy promoters tend to be the ones with more regulatory inputs. Okay, so these observations are, are explained by this idea, and we sort of also tested it a bit more directly by, by using this embarrassingly simple model where we say, let's try to explain the noise of a given promoter in a given condition by a linear function of how many binding sites this promoter has for a certain transcription factor T times some noise propagating activity of the transcription factor T in condition C, so this is the simple linear model. So this thing is measured. This thing we know from the literature which promoters are targeted by which transcription factors. So we can now fit these noise propagating activities to try and explain the variation in noise levels. And we see that we can, it's, you know, it's an incredibly trivial model, so it only explains a modest amount of the variation in noise levels across genes in each condition, but much more than when you randomize these things. So this simple model that the, the noise of a gene can be explained by the noise of its regulators can, can capture a substantial amount of the variation in noise levels in these conditions. All right, so that was point two. Gene expression fluctuations come from propagation of noise through the regulatory network. Ingredient three, phenotypic heterogeneity systematically decreases with growth rate. Okay, so, um, so we looked at these noise levels, and now you can ask, well, how do these noise levels depend on the growth rates of the cells? And then basically what we see is that both this lower bound on noise, 
So this is this noise floor, right? This is the lowest noise level that unregulated promoters have. Systematically decreases with the growth rate of the cells. And then also, if you now look at the distribution of this excess noise, this noise on top of this lower bound, um, this is much, has a lower mean and a much narrower distribution in fast growth than here in stationary phase. So as you grow slower, both the mean excess noise and the variation in excess noise across promoters gets bigger. All right, so the general observation is when cells are growing fast, there's also much less noise, and when cells are growing slow or are growth uh, arrested, there is much more variability in noise levels. And we think, although we have not yet, uh, okay, so this, this may be true, but I'm still not entirely sure that this is the main reason, but it's sort of, it's logical to suspect that maybe the same uh, mechanism as that I told you about earlier for these regulatory switches is at work here, that when cells are diluting faster, that fluctuations may be dampened out more effectively than when cells are growing slow. All right, and so the final ingredient uh, to this little picture is, um, is something that Dan talked about last week already, but I don't know, the overlap of the number of people is, let's say, uh, modest. So I will, uh, I will very briefly mention it again, and that is that a strategy in which cells randomly switch their phenotype at rates that decrease with the growth rate of the cell can be a very efficient adaptation strategy. All right, so many of you have probably heard of this idea of bed hatching. So I'm, I'm uh, showing here a paper from Ido Kossel and Stan Leibler from uh, 2005, where the idea is that um, single cells sort of stochastically switch between different phenotypes, and then environments also stochastically switch between different environments. And the idea is that, um, so environments, they randomly switch, cells also randomly switch phenotype, and you can describe this kind of system by what is the growth rate of each phenotype J in each environment I, and what are the switching rates that cells have from each phenotype J to I, which you assume is independent of the environment, right? Because otherwise they would be sensing their environment. So this is really stochastic switching that has nothing to do with the environment you're in. You're just randomly switching yourself in between, between environments. And then you can, in uh, such a model, work out long-term evolutionary growth rate and see that such a bet hedging strategy where there's no sensing or regulation at all can still function well as long as environments are long-lived enough and as long as the number of different environments you switch between is not large enough. So basically what you see here in this very toy example is the cells, they start out in this purple environment and, in this, and there are three phenotypes, purple, red, and green. And in the purple environment, only the purple cells are growing fast, but they randomly switch between. So what has happened when they, when they start out in the green state, so all the cells are in the green state, and only a few in the purple and red, but now in the purple environment, because the purple cells are growing, and the red and green are not, they start taking over the population, and eventually they dominate the population, and so if the environment lasts a long time, you have a good growth rate, now the environment switches to the red environment, and then you see, well, there were little amount of red originally, but they expand, and then after some time, now again, the population is dominated by red guys. And so you can work out that the long-term growth rate that you have with such a bet hedging strategy is the maximal growth rate minus a cost that goes like one over the average length of the environments that comes from the uh, small amounts of other guys that always exist in each environment, plus another cost that is coming essentially from the entropy of the environment that you don't know between which environments you're going to switch. All right, so this was the sort of standard bet hitching model. And so what now what Dan did is he said, what if I add one more ingredient? And that is that even though the cells are not sensing their environment, they're sensing their own growth rate. And a fast-growing cell is just less stochastic than a slow-growing cell. So the switching rates are systematically higher for slow-growing cells than for fast-growing cells. And this is the only ingredient that you add. 
And now you see that basically that adds one more term here in this equation, and this term can be very large, depending on what is the, the rates of switching between fast and slow growing cells. And basically the idea is when the environment changes, now all these cells, they were growing nice and fast. They find themselves in a new environment. They stop, they stop growing fast, they're growing slow, and they essentially panic. They become very, uh, they become much more heterogeneous. So they're all starting to change their phenotypes until some guys happen to venture on a phenotype that supports growth in this environment. And when they start growing faster, they also automatically stabilize their phenotype. All right? So the fact that they not only grow more so they expand, but they also stabilize their phenotype, whereas the ones that still haven't found a good phenotype keep being very fidgety and changing their phenotype, this hugely improves the, the effectivity of bed hedging. What's the time now? Ah, OK. So now I will tell you this thing. OK. So all of you know, yes. So uh, this, this is really beautiful work. Um, in terms of um, the, the four points that you mentioned, I think only in point one there is sensing, right? In all of the other points, it's only um, regulators that are, yes. that are present and that you know, at low growth rates produce more different phenotypes. And then this can lead to adaptation. So can you speculate a bit on um, the generality of this? So basically, does this only work for cells that have lots of regulatory programs? And cells that you know have few regulators, for example, cells with smaller genomes, it wouldn't work for them. Well, it, it would work, but it would work a lot less because they have a lot less phenotypic dimensions to explore, essentially. And do you think there's a, a large cost to carrying a lot of regulatory programs? Uh, <laughs> no comment. Now, I, 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 all these things of this is costly, not costly. I have no idea. There's so many cases where there are things where we obviously think in the lab this is going to be costly and then we cannot detect any cost. Okay, so, so, so yes, I can sort of speculate, but, but I think all this speculation is kind of pointless. I, I, I don't believe we know. We, we have no idea what they're trying to do. I, I have no idea what, what, what these cells are trying to optimize. I, zero idea. You showed this plot in the beginning where, you know, a lower, smaller genome size means fewer yes. transcription factors, right? Yeah, the number of transcription factors goes quadratically with genome sizes, yes. So these cells would have a harder time to adapt. Well, it's very, okay, so, so uh, if you go all the way on this, on the, so Mycoplasma genitalium, right, has 400 whatever something genes. It has like one, two transcription factors, depending on how you count, right? Because is the RNA polymerase a transcription factor? Well, yeah, of course it has that. It has a, a sigma factor, and maybe it has one heat shock or something like this. And then it's game over, right? If you go to a streptomyces cherry color, which has 10,000 genes, it has 1,200 transcription factors. I think it has more than fly. Fly has 800. Okay, so. Yes, the regulatory complexity is, is going up really, really fast, right? So Sergei and I have been talking for 20 years about why is that. <laughs> and we have some ideas. I mean, Sergei had some very good ideas of why this is happening. But I, but I would say, OK, is it really totally convincingly shown, understood why and what is driving cells towards higher number of transcription factors? I, I don't think so. But this is a totally different topic, I would say, right? I'm just asking, how is E. coli getting to grow in, in heavy water? What is it? How does that work? How did it solve that problem? Yes. Hi, Eric. Uh, nice, nice work and nice addition to the uh, good old uh, leibler cassell model. And I, I generally, I buy what you're selling. I have one concern, though, that uh, looking for uh, you know, adaptation to, to something completely new, uh, I, I just don't believe that you can do it by pure, you know, shooting in the dark with all the noise firing on all from all cannons. 
There should be, again, the fact that the noise increases as the growth rate slows down is real, and it helps. Uh, but I believe that there needs to be yet another ingredient to this model. I, I kind of only have a vague idea of how it should look like, but you should be looking for this adapted solution hierarchically. You first kind of start by adapting expression level of all genes, uh, kind of systematically by, for instance, changing the level of supercoiling or something. And that gives you kind of a rough adaptation to a condition, and then you start fine-tuning and you kind of fine tune, because if you are just, there are so many combinatorially many things which you need to uh, optimize that by just doing it, by, 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 by having everything noisy, would not solve the really complex problems. That, that's kind of my gut feeling about it. And again, I have only one data point, which is not exactly the adaptation, but rather evolution, but you may say that adaptation is just a fast evolution. So when you look at what mutated first in Lensky experiments, one of the earliest mutations in pretty much all of the lines, and which uh, happened to be also with the largest fitness uh, uh, increase, was uh, uh, some, uh, su some protein controlling the supercoiling of, of DNA, which is like controlling the expression levels of across the entire genome. And then you can kind of then start fine-tuning. Maybe you overshoot here and maybe undershooting here and then start kind of fine-tuning. So that, that's kind of my, my gut feeling about the very complex problem of looking for an adaptive solution. OK, so I think we have to make a decision whether we talk about this during the coffee break or I'm trying, because I mean, I, I think I, I agree with 80% of what you say, and I have a lot of stuff to say about it, but, but uh, it's all kind of speculative. So, I mean, it seems to, I, okay, so we could go into discussion now, or I could try to get a couple more things out. Yeah. I don't know how yeah, much, <laughs> uh, because otherwise would, I, this discussion is sort of uh, open-ended, I think. Um, so, and I realize I should have, taking you through this. because So this is my sort of speculative picture of how I see this working. It doesn't, it doesn't yet contain all the ingredients that you also touched on, but this is another thing, and I don't want to discuss this now. So all right. So OK, so in this picture, in this cartoon here, this three-dimensional space is phenotype space. OK, so phenotype space is way higher dimension, but uh, here it's three. And, um, and then each dot is a cell. And then the color tells you what is the growth rate in different parts of the phenotype space. OK, so here this bullseye here, that's where the growth rate is highest. Then it goes down here. There is another patch here where the growth rate is also reasonable, but not uh, as high as here. And then there is a larger area where there is some growth, but it's not so bad. And then outside, there is no, no growth, right? And so. So the sensing and regulation do not basically set one phenotype for the cells, but they restrict cells to some subtype, subspace of phenotype space that based on the sensing cells know this is roughly the area where I have to play. Okay? So certain things that you know are certainly not there, they're off, and certain things, stresses that are certainly there, you respond to, and so on. But it leaves a large space of things that you're not certain about. And those regulators will be fluctuating from cell to cell because they're not quite really sure about the, the environment. And that, those fluctuations will propagate um, and cause these uh, cells to sort of randomly move through this subspace that the regulators have constrained, sensing and regulation have constrained them to. But the movement of subspace is not really random, right? Because it's still controlled by fluctuations that they sense propagating through the regulatory network and turning genes up and down that are relevant for the regulators that are fluctuating, right? So it's not a totally random movement. Um, then the growth rate sets the sensitivity of the regulatory circuits and the rate at which the cells move. So that means that if you're in an area of the space where the growth rate is lower, you're more likely to move 
than if you're in an area of the space where the growth rate is faster. So the arrows are bigger here than they are there. Okay. And this now causes, because also these cells, because the cells that are near these high growth rates not only slow down their diffusion, but also increase the rate, but they're also du duplicating it at a faster rate. Not much, it doesn't take much time before most of the population is found in the region of the space where the growth rate is best. Okay? So that's, that's sort of the, the picture that I uh, wanted to, uh, and so, okay, so either we can now discuss or I have five minutes in which I tell you about um, how this is used to determine the sugar carbon source hierarchy in E. coli. Okay, so as all of you know, or uh, the, the rate at which E. coli can grow on a given carbon source is a hyperbolic function of the, of the concentration of this uh, carbon source. So the, the growth rate the, the, is called the Monod curve as a function of the concentration is something like this. Now imagine cells are growing at some rate and some new nutrient X appears in the environment at some concentration C. Now the cells are going to have to decide whether they're going to switch to eat that nutrient or they stay with the nutrient that they're currently eating. And the growth rate that they can achieve on X is a hyperbolic function uh, of, the, of this concentration C, so it follows a curve like that. And so if your current growth rate is this purple growth rate here, then essentially you will only want to switch if you're going to improve your growth rate so that says there is some critical concentration here. I would like to only switch if the concentration of the new nutrient X is bigger than wherever this current growth rate intersects this mono curve. Okay? So that basically says I want the critical concentration of this nutrient X to depend on the current growth rate that I have in a way that is the exact inverse of this, of this mono curve. All right? So depending on how fast I'm currently growing, I'm going to switch to X, but I'm only going to switch to X if there is more of X, namely sufficiently more that I will grow faster when I've switched. Right? And in order for that to, to be the case, this induction threshold has to grow with growth rate as the inverse of the Monod curve for that nutrient. OK. So we've just seen that due to this growth coupled sensitivity, right, these feedback loops only go critical at the rate that depends on growth rate, and it goes up with growth rate. And we saw that it goes like lambda squared divided by uh, the expression of the promoter, the production from the promoter, as a function of growth rate. So now the question is, can I pick that function? Right? So this is, what is the full induction of the lac operon as a function of growth rate? Can I pick that in such a way that this function becomes equal to that function? Okay? So the question is, can we pick A of lambda such that secret as a function of lambda is the C mono? So this is the mono curve. This is the, the one that came from this growth coupled sensitivity. I want them to be equal. Okay, so these things need to be equal. That says, the production from the promoter has to go like uh, growth rate times one minus growth rate over the maximal growth rate as a in this carbon source at saturation. And that's equivalent to saying that the full induction of the lac operon as a function of growth rate must decrease linearly with growth rate. Okay, that's, that way, that's what comes out. That's what you have to have. And it turns out we already know from work from Terry Wah's lab that that's exactly how CRP regulates the lac operon. Okay, it's going down linearly with, uh, with growth rate and it intersects at the, at the maximum. And so this says CRP regulation already implements this. Okay, so then we can go test this. So we tested this in the mother machine. So these were some heroic experiments that were done by uh, Tomai and, uh, and Teo, actually, also, where we basically um, grow uh, E. coli with this Luxy GFP in the mother machine, either 
in just lactose or just glucose at different concentrations of glucose going down to very low levels, or a mixture of lactose at a fixed high level plus glucose at different levels. All right? So, um, so here, this is the theoretical prediction, right? So now the critical concentration is exactly this inverse of the Monod curve. And the first thing that, uh, that Theo and Thomas checked is that it's indeed true that as, that as I'm lowering the growth rate by lowering the concentration of sugar, the LACSI GFP at full induction is, so with growth rate, it's going down linearly. All right, so but this is now measured at the single cell level. So this con confirms the result previously from the wild lab in um, bulk level. But now we can go to the single cell level. Okay, so what do you see here? So here on the left, this little uh, pink dot is showing you what's the distribution of growth rates of the cell when they grow only in lactose, and then all the cells are induced. In light blue, you see the distributions of growth rates of cells when they're growing only in glucose of different concentrations. So you see that that is essentially following this Monod curve, where this is the maximal growth rate, and then it's you know, below sort of 20 micromolar glucose, it starts going down roughly linearly. And now the dark dots are when the cells are growing on a mixture of lactose and glucose at different concentrations. And then we can look at the cells and we can see from GFP which individual single cells are induced and which individual single cells are not induced. And then we can compare what are the growth rates of the cells that are induced with what are the growth rates of the cells that are not induced. And we can ask what fraction of the cells is induced. And here you see what is the fraction of cells that is induced as a function of concentration of glucose. And you see that if the glucose concentration is low, everybody's induced. And then at some point it switches over and now nobody's induced or almost nobody. And so what you see here is that when you're at very low glucose, the growth rate on glucose is much lower than on lactose, and essentially everybody is induced. And at some point here, there is this switch, and the switch occurs exactly when the growth rates of glucose and lactose are matched. Okay, so we indeed see that this system, when you change the amount of, of glucose, by the time you added enough glucose that the growth rate on glucose is now equal to the growth rate on lactose, now the cells start switching, okay? So the, the cells indeed implement this. And then finally, for you, you guys know about these growth laws, right? I can also change growth rate by adding chloramphenicol, by slowing down translation, right? And as you may have seen, then if you ask what is now the expression of the lacoporon as a function of growth rate, it's not going down linearly, but it's going up linearly with growth rate, okay? The P sector is now going up linearly with growth rate, not down linearly with growth rate. We also confirm that, okay? So uh, this is, in the experiments we did, we see also that the maximum lux E expression is now going up linear with growth rate if you modulate growth rate with chloramphenicol. And then the prediction of the theory is that the critical concentration should now be independent, right? Because instead of going like one over lambda, it's going like lambda, and it cancels the lambda squared, and then we confirm this as well, okay? So when you modulate the growth rate, not with nutrients, but with chloramphenicol, then the cells don't change their sensitivity. The sensitivity stays the same. Okay, I think that's it. Yes, that's all I wanted to tell you, so that's the... But we have time for a couple of questions, and then we can move uh, to the coffee break for the discussion. <laughs> Thanks, nice stuff. So I was wondering, um, you showed this connection of promoter noise and the number of regulators. Yeah. Can you comment on the role of um, binding site affinity in this whole means story? To, <laughs> means to be high enough. Now, yeah, I, I, I don't know, can you... Make so the if the question more concrete, obviously the amount of binding is going to uh, depend on the binding site affinity, but so it depends on lots of other things. Where is the site in the promoter? And uh, so sure. So, but I so I'm wondering if there's also a connection of noise to binding site affinity 
four different transcription factors. So how noise then is integrated um, again? OK, what I can say is that we've tried to understand sort of can we more bio, get a better biophysical understanding of how the noise propagation works for, let's say, one example, Regulon. So there's one example, Regulon, the Lex A Regulon, where we looked at promoters that are only regulated by Lex A, as far as we know, but have sites of different affinity or different numbers of sites, and then basically put the cells in a condition where Lex A is a bit induced because there are some double strand breaks, but not so much that they die, right? And then see how is the noise of these promoters going as I make more double strand breaks or less double strand breaks. And it turns out to be very complicated. Okay? But all I can tell you is that, uh, yes, depending on precisely what kind of binding sites you have where, how much noise propagation you're going to get at what level of fluctuations in the regulator may be some non-trivial function. Okay. okay. So there's no simple rule as far as I know. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. How do you look into DNA methylation, which is a long-term way to fine-tune gene expression? Not in bacteria, as far as I know. I mean, maybe I'm unaware, but uh, this is um, in eukaryotes. In, in bacteria, DNA methylate is mainly used for uh, repair to know what is the new and what's the old strand, as far as I know. But it, I don't think it affects gene regulation. OK, I mean, in biology and everything, never. OK, I'm <laughs> sure there's some effect. But I don't think it's like in eukaryotes that it's a main tumor of gene regulation. In eukaryotes, the whole story with nucleosomes and chromatin so it become, becomes a totally, totally different question of what determines noise level. So yes. I mean, just related to the first question, so is there any relation between this noise level and codon bias? Or has anyone? The codon bias is in, is in, uh, in the open reading frames, where the binding sites are in the intergenic region. So they're, they're sort of in different parts of the genome. There's no codon bias in the intergenic region. OK. Thanks for the talk. I was thinking about trying to like, see the, the generality of the model in the sense that maybe uh, growth rate is just one of the control parameters we can use, maybe for other kind of organisms that not, are not necessarily always fast growing, something like that. In ecology, we have m many niches. You can implement something very similar in the sense that something else is regulating the sensibility of the cell. Like. M m uh, I, I don't know precisely, but it is like the control parameter can also be a parameter of your general framework. Maybe not only growth rate, maybe if you extend it to tissues and something like that. No, I mean, complex. you can imagine using any signal to set the sensitivity of your regulatory circuits in one way or another. The question is, you get this one for free because it's done by dilution. You don't need to have any machinery to do it. And second is the growth rate is really a thing that tells you whether you're doing well or whether you're doing badly, right? Because I really don't know what is fitness, but in general, when you grow faster and more in the same environment, you're doing better than when, you, when you're not. No. Generally, right? So, so this parameter, it's not just one random phenotype, right? It's, it's Thinking, I was thinking about the uh, regulation in general in the sense of a tissue, for instance, that are heavily regulated but by well-defined signals like growth factors and so on. Maybe that you can extend that the growth factor have some kind of similar uh, effect on the sensibility of the whole network, and that's how the network, like the same way it will pursue uh, 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 or, or modify their phenotype searching so to fit growth rate in this case, maybe in the tissue they are trying to fit this other, let's say, artificial uh, environmental signal that is okay, the so growth factor. So it yeah. is certainly true, and I, I certainly like to speculate that the sort of uh, sense that, that, um, that you can have a regulatory switch turn on or off dependent on the growth rate of the cells may also be used in development to make certain cells switch to certain phase where other cells don't switch to certain phase. So there might be a distribution of growth rates in some precursor tissue where cells are differentiating 
such that now the faster growing guys in this tissue are going to go to one fate, and the slower growing guys in the tissue are going to go to another fate, and that that can be used in, uh, in, uh, in development, uh, this mechanism too? Yes, I'd like to speculate that this happens. <coughs> I found a way how to turn my kind of uh, very nebulous comment into a sharp question. Yes. Uh, is there, you know, based on your theory, uh, regulator, <laughs> noise and regulators is one way how the cell searches for new phenotypes. And we know that regulators come in different uh, uh, out degree distributions. Some are global regulators controlling many things. Some are very local regulators. Yeah. Do you see any uh, trends in the noise level of a regulator as a function of its out degree. You have convincingly demonstrated that the larger is the in degree of a gene, the higher would be the noise, just because there are more independent regulators. What about the out degree trend? It depends on the condition. That's the problem, right? So that I, there are some conditions where the lock operon becomes very, very noisy, right? And even though it targets only one thing, most conditions, it won't be noisy, right? And, and so, um, and there are also some conditions where, you know, CRP is so saturated, doesn't matter that it targets so many things, it's not going to propagate any noise because it's not noisy. So it's really a condition-dependent uh, thing. I mean, the only thing that, so we've asked, are there any regulators that are always propagating noise? no matter what, in the eight conditions we've tested. And then we found this is mainly those, um, uh, uh, those histone-like things, mm -hmm. like this HNS, FIS, IHF. Those things, if you have predicted binding sites, that seems to predict that you're generically more noisy across all these conditions. And they're global regulators. They are global regulators. But for many, many of the ones that listen to signals, right, there, there it looks like it really depends on whether the signal is in a regime where they don't really know whether to go all on or all off, and some go on and some go off, right? Um, at some point, you showed a formula. Uh, you derived it from some circuit. Yeah. Uh, about the, the induction threshold as a function of the growth rate. Yeah. Um, and did you mention that there can be many circuits that will achieve the same thing? Is that a fairly robust thing, that quadratic dependence that you got? No, no, you can change the scaling. But this circuit is, I mean, this thing is, if any circuit has been studied to death, it's this one. Okay, so the lock circuit I can tell you about it. <laughs> I found out trying to search the literature going all the way back to the 60s. But, but there, it's not like we're guessing this circuit. This circuit is very well understood. Um, yes, but you know, this, uh, uh, you had a formula uh, where the induction threshold yeah. was quadratic in lambda, and it had that denominator A of lambda, yeah. uh, which you mentioned at that point was a slowly varying function of lambda. As it turns out later on, it's a linear function. Wait, wait, wait. Now I'm confused. I'm confused about your question. But, ah, there it is. Yeah. Here. So you had that, right? Induction threshold. That A of lambda, that's, that's the quadratic function uh, on top. And this A of lambda is a slowly varying function. These two you can ignore. OK. Unless lambda gets very, very small. OK? You go grow the rest, then these things matter. But if you're. A of lambda goes like lambda, 1 minus lambda over lambda star, where lambda star is the maximal possible rate you can grow on any carbon source. Okay? And the fact that it goes like that is because of the way that CRP regulates this operon. But I can change this. I can make this a constant. Right? I mean, this, this is a function of what, what the promoter is regulated by. And I know that this lock operon is regulated, apart from the repressor that is in this circuit, by this global regulator called CRP that is basically sensing how good is my CRP, uh, my carbon source, and what is, what is the carbon flux. So and, uh, uh, I just wanted to ask that this quadratic dependence on lambda, is it 
very generic. Ah, yeah, but th this comes from the fact that there is one dilution rate of the intracellular inducer. So the concentration of the in inducer is basically a, a, a balance between how fast is it pumped in versus how fast is the cell diluting. And the level of this lock C and lock Y, they are a balance of how fast are the, are the proteins being produced by gene expression and how fast is dilution diluting them out. And these two factors, lambda, give you lambda squared. But like in this two-component system, I can easily make a lambda to the third if I want. Okay? Because there's an extra lambda in there. OK, OK, we've got to go for coffee. But thanks for the patience and thanks for the talk. I want to just circle back to the deuterium and the kinetic isotope effects. Yeah. So we've got this dilution going on. Um, changing the concentration of molecules, that's setting the sensitivity, we've got this regulator-target relationship going on, but I, I can't connect this to deuterium because it seems different. When you swamp the cell with deuterium, there's no escape from it, so you can't dilute your way out. And it, so it just seems like a, a little bit of a different problem or a concept in my mind, and I'm just, I just wanted to have a little bit of a comment or explanation about how you see the relationship between the KIE in the metabolism. Okay, so you and the want regulation. me to waffle less and be a bit more concrete about how can this possibly solve this deuterium case, right? Okay. Everything you so, presented was good and not waffling, yeah, yeah, but the, yeah, 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 I'm yeah, lingering yeah. with the KIE. Uh, no, but no, okay, so I think this also comes back to something of Sergey that I haven't answered yet, but I'm not going to answer now. But, but the thing is, um, so what I'm imagining is that the cell has sort of internal, the, the sensors that are there are not just for the outside world, but it's for how am I doing myself, okay? And so when a certain flux is too low, right, because you're using up these components faster than they're coming in, this may now activate whatever the upstream reactions are that typically increase that flux, right? Because so the cell has a logic to say to that certain things are not going fast enough, certain things are going fast enough. So what I'm imagining is when you add the deuterium, certain things are now going way faster than before, certain things are really slowed down, and basically the cells are sort of randomly trying out changes until they hit on something where these fluxes are, 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 are working better than they were before. And so this is also the way you see the state, you see that certain reactions that now run much faster, slower, with deuterium than with normal water, some dehydrogenation or hydrogenation reactions. These enzymes are totally upregulated. There are way more of them than there are normally. But I think that it finds its way to such a solution largely by trial and error. That, that, yes. Very last question. Yeah, it's kind of similar to Sanjay's question. So uh, for growth rate dependent sensitivity, you say that it's mainly mediated by dilution. Um, uh, of course, that function there, it also seems uh, pretty important, right? So, uh, so in some sense, growth rate uh, dependent sensitivity uh, is affected by dilution, but there's also another component, right? Which is basically how these parameters depend with lambda. And um, Which one? So the, the A parameter, for instance, right? So yes. just, just to see if I got that right. right. So for a constitutive promoter, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. A is essentially roughly constant. Mm -hmm. It's not quite true, but, but OK. For, uh, for the lock operon, we know that it's going down linearly mm -hmm. with growth rate because of the C of C thing. But if you're changing the growth rate with chromophenicol, we know it goes up. And actually, it will precisely compensate the lambda squared mm -hmm. when you so yes, I totally agree with you, okay? But generically, there will, like if you have a two, two intermediate steps, there will be a lambda squared mm -hmm. that you have to compensate. And if you don't, if you have like a constituent expression, then it will go roughly like lambda squared. Okay. Right? So it's sort of the, the default case is that it will, will become less sensitive, but of course you can regulate your promoter to counteract it. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can do that. Okay, let's thank uh, Eric again. <laughs> and of course, per tradition, we are late. <laughs>